Welcome to our monthly event. My name is Sabela, and as part of PISAC's coordination committee, I'll be your moderator this afternoon. I'm very happy to see so many of you joining us today. So, well, first of all, I just want to thank you for this on behalf of the entire team. Today, we will be discussing the topic of communicating culture. But before we get into the subject, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Riley Marshall, to make some missing announcements for us. What do we like? I would like to welcome all of you as well. I just have a few quick announcements today. One is that ESAC has opened a photography and visual arts contest related to the themes of our talk so far. And you can find more information will be posted in the chat. The deadline for the submission will be March 21st. And my second announcement is that the April ESAC talks is already in the works. We will be exploring World Heritage Challenges and Opportunities and the deadline for the abstract submission will be April 8th and we will share that information in the chat as well. And keep an eye on the chat today during the presentation, we will be sending you more information about our speakers and our events. Thank you, that's all I have. Thanks Riley, lots of interesting stuff coming up. Uh, now, moving on to our talks of the day, I'll give you just a brief schedule for those who have not been here before. First, we will hear from our keynote speaker, Sandra Mans, who will be followed by our other four speakers. We have five minute presentation each. I just want to ask you to please enjoy them and take note of any questions or thoughts you may have to share them with us in our Q&A afterwards. The event will conclude dividing us into smaller breakout rooms to discuss some questions we prefer, we've prepared about communicating culture. I think it's a very interesting time to exchange views, so I invite you to stay. As well, I'd like to mention that each of the speakers here today has been asked with leaving us a, a provoking question, and we will be posting those on our media channels so I'd like to encourage you all to leave your comments there after the event. Now is the time. It is my pleasure to introduce you today to our keynote speaker, Sandermans, who will talk to us about his work as the creative director of Saint Receive. He was raised in Netherlands and Oman, graduated from the Design Academy in Doven, and holds an MA in philosophy from the European Graduate School. Writer, product designer, and previously part of the public affairs team for OMA in Rotterdam, Prior to joining OMA, Sander worked as well as a researcher for the Dutch design studio Dengiris Lab. He has published essays on architecture, technology, and design, and taught at the Design Academy in Dublin. I'm glad to have you here. Now, please, Sander, the floor is yours. Uh, a bit of my, um, my own career path and what I'm doing now here at Send Receive. Um, Send Receive is a, a communications firm uh, that uh, I founded together with my partner, business partner Jeremy Higginbotham last year in March. So we had our first anniversary uh, last week. And what an interesting work. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation, Sandra. Thank you. Um, now let's just start with our four speakers. First of all, we have Paula. Uh, she graduated in cultural anthropology with an MA in Euroculture. Paula is specialized in memory, heritage, and museology. Currently involved on her PhD, focused on the transgenerational transmission of memories in Spain. And for the last three years, she's been a group coordinator for European Heritage Volunteers. Now, please, Paula, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen do you see my presentation okay perfect so um due to constraint of time i'm not gonna focus that much on the historical contextualization of spain as you can see my presentation is about the memories as a franco regime uh, in media so um just to give a brief overview, and I know it's kind of bold of me to assume you will know the history of Spain when we don't even study it here, but I will try to give it, to keep it short to just two short sentences. So Spain started in the 1930s being one of the most advanced democracies and ended up being one of the most repressive and cruel dictatorship, which lasted till 1975 uh, when Franco died. After his death, uh, a monarchy was established and the transition to democracy started with many different laws. One of the most important is the law of amnesty from 1977, 
because it's considered as a political pack of silence uh, that flooded Spanish society and culture till the 2000s, um, when an associative movement of the victims started and with it, the recovery of the Spanish counter memories. Since this movement started, the memories of the victims have erupted in the public and political sphere and became a constant in Spanish media and culture. Many books, series, movies, documentaries are focused on these events and um, you can even hear some people say, oh, another movie about the Spanish Civil War when a new movie comes out. Um, in contrast to this cultural victim focus, the media has had its own path and is still divided in how we approach this past. Um, a first glance to the Spanish media shows that Spain never got over this division between Republicans and Francoists, uh, because we still find this division nowadays, now under the names of left and right. So to give you an example, um, let's see how different newspapers echoed the last draft bill of the law of historical memory, or law of democratic memory last November. First, these are two newspapers from the right, so La Razón and El Español. Um, if you read the, um, the articles, which you have uh, some more excerpts there, the main narrative they are claiming are the narrative of the foundational myth of the Spanish democracy in the transition, and they're echoing the narrative of a national reconciliation and a Kiristans of violence that started in 1970s. And then we have the left, El Diario and Publico, which focus more on the victims' claims and um, that were made during the last 20 years, and their specific aims and what the law is going to do. Um, this same division, we can still find it in the political sphere. Uh, this divorce between right and left is still very much present and has become part of the political DNA of the parties. It is intrinsic to their political identities that the left defends the memory and the right rejects the memorial movement. Some examples of what has been said in the Congress by uh, politicians from the Partido Popular, which is a right party. Mr. Muñoz said 15 million so you can dig up some bones uh, regarding the exhumation of mass graves of victims. Manuel González, which is a really showing his ideology, said uh, they were sentenced to death because they deserve it. And Francisco Camp said Zapatero's grandfather didn't convey him affection. This is especially problematic because Zapatero was the prime minister of Spain and his grandfather was killed during the repression of the Franco's regime because of being a Republican. But I think the most striking example is when Vox, the extreme right party, uh, won some seats in the Madrilian parliament and they recovered the banner from, their, um, from when the civil war was in Madrid and the Republican banner well, while they were protecting the city and that they will not pass, uh, turn into we have passed. Um, so they are identifying themselves with the Franco regime and using the Franco's memories to legitimize their existence. And the last day is a couple of days ago, like on Monday, the current president of Madrid went on, went on national television and said, if they called you a fascist, it's because you're doing things right, you're on the right side of history. So um, depends on the space we're in, we find one memory or the other. In the cultural sphere, as I've said, there seems to be an agreement on echoing the suffering of the victims during the dictatorship. But on the media and the political sphere, there is still a division between right and left. Um, and uh, there is a constant mentioning of mass graves, the war and the transition as the foundation of today's democracy, leaving behind other victimhood stories. Um, so after 80 years, the past continues to be problematic and unsettling. There is not one narrative being transmitted, but different opposite ones. And there are many narrators who foster the conflict and overshadow the victims. So the public arena has become kind of a boxing ring of memories and, and narratives and historical experiences that fight in a zero-sum game where they can only be one winner. And I think one of the main problems of how media is um, done in Spain is that it creates bubbles of communication. So you only see, read and view what you already agree with. And on the weird occasion that you encounter someone with a different uh, opinion, you call them like crazy and extremist, but we are failing to see the other side of the coin that is just not a few people uh, with different ideas and not defending the victims' claims is not common sense, but part of a political ideology, which in Spain is from the left. Um, say this. Um, 
so I thought of some ideas to foster that dialogue to the later breakout rooms. So is there, um, I think these are some ideas I actually never ever thought about until I started my research. So is there a difficult path in your country and how is it communicated? Who are the narrators? What do they say? And if these narratives are part of the mainstream and official memories? And that's it from my side. I hope I managed to do it in five minutes. It was great. Thank you very much, Paula, for exposing the role of communication in these highly controversial situations. And um, we will now continue with Selena. She's from Macau, graduated in heritage management from IFTM and currently involved in a conservation of monuments and sites master's program at KU Leuven. Uh, she was also Deputy Managing Director at Macau Cultural Heritage Reinventing Studies Association and had a half year internship at the University of Ebora Hercules Laboratory. All these experiences allowed her to be sensitive to the connection between sociology, sustainability and cultural heritage conservation and management. Now, please, Selena, the floor is yours. I will first um, share my screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you all see? Oh, okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Selena, and also you can call me Ben Yang. Uh, is my Chinese name. Um, currently I'm the master student in KU Leuven, and I study conservations. And thank you for your introductions. Uh, and um, everyone know me. I graduated from actually in a management council fields. So this is also the reason why I continue my study uh, with conservation because I want to be uh, 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 see heritage in different points of view, maybe in heritage conservations and maybe in sociology. So I started my master's degree and today I'm going to present you uh, my study, the road of intercultural educations and communication in cultural heritage conservation and management in a multicultural city. And I will take Macau as an example. Uh, this is where I come from. Uh, first of all, I think it's very important to understand what is multi multicultural city before my whole presentation. So actually multicultural city is a city with the concept of multiculturalism. Um, and some people may ask what is multiculturalism and actually it's a concept already exists since a long time. Uh, even during the Roman uh, period of time, we already have multiculturalism. And this is either um, a natural process or sometimes it's an artifact process. For example, a huge amount of immigrations or uh, sometimes it's because of some specific historical event, for example, uh, industrial revolutions. And here I have um, three examples. Uh, I provide nine different pictures, but actually they are just uh, from three different city. Uh, the first line, uh, the first three picture they are from Singapore. And the second line, they are from the capital of Argentina. And then the first line, they are from Sevilla. Um, now we can see that actually, this is what we call multicultural city. This is a um, coexistence of different kinds of city, uh, no, sorry, different kinds of culture, but at the same time, they still keep their own uh, specific identity. And they, you can show in different way, for example, in the communication, of view or their thinking or sometimes even architecture as here we can see that different architecture style um, exists in just one city. So uh, what is the problem for herit uh, heritage conservation and management in a multicultural city? Some people they may say that multiculturalism is too uh, ideal because this may not really exist. How is it possible all the uh, uh, culture they can be together without any problem? And, and it's true that a lot of uh, scientists, they make their study in a multicultural city and then they find that actually they don't trust each other, uh, especially when they are come from uh, different uh, uh, regions or different places, they don't really trust each other. They even don't trust the local government or the local paper. They I mean that uh, we don't trust the people that with different faces. Uh, so when this comes to the heritage conservation and management, it make a huge problem because during the 
discussion of the conservation process, people will have some misunderstanding of other people's culture, and also they will have disrespectful. For example, uh, today when we want to demolish um, uh, a cathedral's uh, church, maybe other religion people, just because they don't understand the culture of the cathedral church, they may say, oh yes, it's a good idea, let's build more uh, the other type of religion's building, but not the cathedral one. And also maybe for some of the, the other type of tangible cultural heritage, for example, eating culture, they don't understand, they may find that the people use their hand to eat is different from them and they don't respect the other people's way of eating. And actually how to solve this problem? I think the, prop, the, the way to solve this problem is based on communication and education, especially in a multicultural city, interculture education and communication is very important. So today I will use my home city as an example. Um, where I come from is Macau. So uh, Macau is a really special city. Uh, it's special in uh, historical points of view as uh, and also in political points of view. Macau was under the Portuguese administrative uh, from the mid 16th century until 1999. And currently Macau is the special uh, administrative regions of the People Republic of China. Uh, we have different type of community in Macau. Uh, we have Chinese, we have Macanese, we have Portuguese, but if you ask them, they will all say we are all Macau people. Uh, we can see the uh, picture I show that uh, in the architectural points of view, uh, Macau have different kinds of style. We have the Chinese temple, we have Chinese garden, but at the same time, we also have a lot of Portuguese style of architecture. This is the, the way that we communicate with each other in the architectural points of view, but it's more than that. But how we make this happen, this is a really long-term process, and now I will explain to you. Uh, first of all, in order to have a very good intercultural communication, first we need to have a very good intereducation. And intereducation is not something only we can learn from school, but at the same time, we have to have a daily educational environment. Uh, here I show the street name of Macau. In Macau, uh, Portuguese and Chinese, they are both the official language. And for the street name, we will have the Portuguese uh, name that uh, given by the Macau Portuguese government before the handover. And then at the same time, we have the uh, direct translation to Chinese. But in some of the place, they will even have a third name or fourth name. Those names are written in Chinese and they are given by the Chinese people live in that area, which means that even look at the name straight in Macau, you can learn a lot of history because you understand the living style of Portuguese, but at the same time, you understand the living style of Chinese in Macau. And also um, when we take the bus, uh, the bus will, will have different language. They, they will um, report in Chinese, in uh, Mandarin, the other type of Chinese, and also they will report in English and also Portuguese. So even I'm not someone that are really good at Portuguese, but just based on this uh, environment, I learn a little bit Portuguese. And this is not enough because this is just an uh, environment, it's just a setting. But at the same time, we have a lot of public education provided by, gov by government. For example, the, the picture here, uh, I don't know if you can see that the with the uh, uh, green, green um, pole, green slide, yeah, here, the, the way I point. Uh, this is a Portuguese speaking country event. They gather all the Portuguese speaking countries, people who live in Macau to, to have this event. During this event, they provide an a, a environment to let everyone to exchange their culture. For example, we can try different type of food, such as Portuguese food or Brazilian food, because Brazil is also a country that speaks Portuguese. They have different kinds of um, culture, traditional, and then we can learn all the things just based on one event. At the same time, we also have a lot of international events um, with different kinds of topics, for example, music. Uh, government invites people from different kinds of country to provide uh, public education to let everyone in Macau understand what happened in other culture and how they practice their culture. And at the end, also school education is very important. Since I was little, I have to learn the Portuguese history. At the same time, I have to learn Chinese history and also as well as Macau history and Hong Kong history, actually. And of course, we learn uh, English and Chinese, but Portuguese is still a very important language for us. So Portuguese is, uh, uh, in most of the universities, an elective course. So if you have interest, you can learn Portuguese. And if you don't have interest, you can 
try the other language. But all these kinds of education allow me to create my own cultural understanding and also multicultural belonging. Here you may have a question, what is multicultural belonging? This is not means that I mix with different kinds of culture. I still consider myself as Chinese, but at the same time I consider myself as Macau people. I will have a more exclusive uh, background. This background allows me to understand others' culture at the same time, how to respect other people's culture. This also, also trains my perspective. I will have a more intercultural perspective in order to communicate with people from the other culture. So how to go from intercultural communication to heritage protection? First, we need a very good environment. We have to create a respectful and common environment for the communications. Um, in a political point of view in Macau, the language of Portuguese is protected by the law, say that um, Portuguese and Chinese language, they are both the official language of uh, Macau. At the same time, the traditions of Portuguese and also uh, their intangible cultural heritage should be protected by law and also should be respected by all the people in Macau. And also we have a lot of consolations for the cultural heritage protection, no matter intangible cultural heritage and tangible cultural heritage, which means that no matter which community you come from, no matter which culture you have, you also have the same chance to attend for those meetings. You have this you have the same way and same environment to talk about your opinions. So at the end, we can see that in a long-term perspective, this is really good for the education and communication, and that everyone can be sensitive for other people's culture. At the same time, you will find um, innovations, um, innovative uh, solution for the management points of view to manage the cultural heritage in a multicultural city, no matter intangible or tangible. Uh, here I have the first picture. This is an um, uh, old church in Macau. This is maybe the only church you can find in the world with uh, have the uh, Chinese written on the facade of the church. At the same time, on our intangible cultural heritage list, we have the uh, Portuguese, Portuguese culture, for example, the Portuguese dance, but at the same time, we have the belief of Ama. It's a very traditional Chinese religion. And sometimes when uh, intercultural education and communication come together, sometimes they create a new culture like Macau because it's already more than 500 years. So a new, new culture will be created due to the intercultural education and communication. We have to keep it in mind that culture is not something never changed, but it changed in a very specific way. Uh, you need some time to change, but it's not just change in one day. And in Macau, at the end, we create our own Macau culture or what we call Macanese culture. Uh, Macanese, they are a group of people mixed between Portuguese and Chinese. They have their own language called Badua. We still have some uh, Badua performance, but now this language only have 10 people know how to speak. But actually in the old time, this is a common language in Macau. And also you can see that we can build a temple just next to a chapel. This is something you may not see in the other um, culture. Also, um, the cooking style is a um, mix between Chinese and Portuguese. You may, you may think that uh, here seems quite perfect, but it's not um, one in one day. This is a uh, growth through for a long process. In the old time, the relationship between Portuguese and uh, Chinese is it was not that good. Uh, during the old time, the uh, love relationship between Portuguese and Chinese was not allowed. But uh, what I want to share with you guys is that uh, when it comes to the heritage conservations, uh, no matter what who we are or uh, what where we are come from, we have to always understand and keep it in mind is that at the end, all the cultural heritage, no matter it's just tradition or the architecture, they are all human priority and human property. We have to keep it in mind that we should um, respect other people's culture and at the same time respect and protect other pe people's culture because they are all human beings. And this is all I want to share today. At the last thing, I, I will give you two questions for um, the, the later um, um, discussion. First of all, uh, UNESCO, they always uh, promote that heritage protection is good for the cultural diversity. But in my point of view, actually, it's the opposite. We should understanding culture first. So in your point of view, do you think that cultural heritage protection should come first? Or you think cultural understanding should come first? And the second is that because today I use a multicultural city as an example, 
but do you think that intercultural education and communication should be commonly used internationally, even for the city that only have one culture? And this is all my sharing. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much for sharing your amazing culture, Selena. Um, now our next speaker will be Lana, currently a PhD student of archaeology and UNESCO Hello. fellowship owner at University of Warsaw. She's doing an internship at the Cultural Heritage Agency of Poland and working at Foundation Okalin as a cultural mentor. Previously, she worked at the Museum of Coney Absaros, taught at the American Georgian School Progress, and from 2010 has been involved in several annual archaeological excavations in Georgia. Now, please, Lana, I give you the floor. Thank you. It's it's an honor for me to be with you and share about my job and my work, what I'm doing with my children. Uh, really, it's like I'm doing with my children because today I want to speak to uh, you about diversity cultural heritage in Georgia, in Nigeria, and its problems. Really, it's like this, that uh, I'm a teacher, as you know, and when I'm working with my children, I realize that I have children from different religions and different culture, but they sometimes don't understand each other. And sometimes they don't care about uh, culture. Uh, for example, in uh, Georgia, in Nigeria, we have a lot of uh, multicultural people from different religions and from different diaspora too. But uh, sometimes they don't care about uh, others' culture. Uh, we have also some problems with government because sometimes government and so don't care about cultural heritage. Maybe, maybe it's not uh, only in Georgia, it's in other countries also. Sometimes they don't protect the cultural heritage and don't care about it. I understand that it's globalization, they want to build some new buildings, but other, other sites, when we are following the tourism, for example, in, in Georgia's case, when we are following to tourism and if we want to uh, have tourists, we should to have something what we should to show them. For example, some cultural heritage monuments, yes. And then I, uh, I understand that not government care about uh, culture, not uh, even education system care about culture and don't show children that they should to care about this. And then with my museum, Ugoni of Saros, we decided to make some popularization of culture and about uh, and popularization of archaeology. And then we start some project, which was for students, for, for young students, children and for young students. And then we start to making popularization of cultural heritage. And then we realized that children don't know about their culture. They don't know about history. They are studying some, of course, from books so that they have very big history and ancient history, but, rea uh, but really they don't realize that the uh, building monuments, which is uh, next to their uh, home, they don't care about this cultural heritage and they don't care, they don't protect this cultural heritage. And then they start to realizing that it's on his own history and they start to realizing that they should to protect, uh, protect this history. Uh, what, uh, of course, we finished this project and uh, the result was very good because the children has uh, knowledge that they should to care about this cultural heritage. And then after we faced new problems, which was uh, cultural religious heritage. Uh, what it means? It means that, for example, I'm Christian, for example, or I'm Muslim or I'm Jewish, it's not matter. But I care about only about my uh, cultural religious monuments, but I don't care about others. And we see this and we decided to make some uh, popularization about this problem. And we start working with children to show them that they should to uh, protect uh, um, not only own cultural heritage, also others religious cultural heritage. Of course, we have a problem with the government because government still don't care about this problem. Uh, but with students, uh, when we start uh, realizing that everyone is, every person is important, every religious is, uh, religious is important, then we have uh, results that they care about other uh, cultural heritage and about other monuments. And what is our problem as so? The problem is that sometimes not only children, uh, sometimes parents don't understand that they should care about this. And sometimes we, uh, we have other problems uh, belonging to this, that uh, Georgia is still a developing country. And so we have not law 
and uh, the people don't follow this, uh, don't follow this law. And as I see uh, uh, pr from previous uh, presentation, we have seen we have similar uh, situation in Georgia because we have a different kind of culture, and we have uh, sometimes it's mix. It's not Europe, it's not Asia. It's very interesting. It's a mix of European and Asian, even in architecture, even in uh, letters, even in. Uh, mentality of people. It's different. Of course, we, uh, of course, I'm proud this is mixed, but the other case, uh, we, even me, and other people, they don't, uh, they should to care about, to protect this, what we have, uh, why we are so interesting for other people, and why we are so interested for, uh, for wars, yes? Uh, of, of course, it's globalization. Of course, we should to be proud of globalization, but at the same time, we should to think that we should to protect our community and our tradition and our uh, culture, which is different as well from other culture, that we should to be more interesting, like be part of globalization, but at the same time to be uh, 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 like uh, be part of this uh, traditional cultural heritage. Thank you. I just wanted to speak with you about our project, what we are doing and about our project that we are doing for uh, popularization with children for the cultural heritage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for bringing us closer to this, Lana. And um, I would like to introduce now our last but not least speaker, Caroline. She completed her Bachelor in Art History in France and is currently involved in the World Heritage Studies Master's Program at BTU. This allowed her to deepen her passion for cultural diversity and intangible cultural heritage, which she uses to celebrate in her kitchen and cities explorations. But apart from all this, she's a very dear member of Paris Ex Coordination Committee. So now please, Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you a lot. And hello, everybody. Let me just share my screen. And yes, here we go. Can you see it properly? I think it's charging, right. So I will be today talking about food as a means of communicating culture and across cultures. And as simple as it sounds, I'm going to start by defining communication and food. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, communication is the imparting or exchanging of information by speaking, writing, or using some other medium. So basically an action involving four elements, sender, receiver, information, and means of transmission. Food is, but can't be resumed to, an organic fuel. It is also the result of history, geographic, and social processes, including cultivation, harvest, breeding, preparation, conservation, and consumption. It is moreover conditioned by a larger social cultural framework, which takes into account the values and beliefs of the particular group. So food is the result of a culinary heritage inscribed in a larger culture, and as such can be a means of transmitting culture. I would like to start from the position of the sender. Bria Savarin wrote, tell me what you eat, I will tell you what you are. Food is well rooted in our individual identities because it's not, it is one of our earliest and fondest cultural memories. It also helps building and expressing a group identity based on common localization and social values involving food. It is one of the factors defining a cultural group belonging. If we take the example of gastronomic French eating, you can see on the diapositive, um, we get a lot of information. The fact of having different glasses refers to the wine growing tradition, meanwhile the number of cutters refers to the habit of eating in several services. So those two elements refer to French culinary heritage. But those elements express our larger cultural background. Having the fork turned down was originally meant to show the family armory stamped on the back of the fork. Having the knife on the right side started back in the medieval times when it was tradition to use weapons from the right hand and to wear them on the left hip in order not to hurt the horse when sad saddling up and it transferred to table customs. It remained because up to the 20th century here be being left-handed was considered as a curse and people were bullied into using the right hand. So food can be a means of transmitting information on one's culinary heritage but more globally on their culture. Now let's move on to the position of the receiver. 
We all have encountered moments of cultural incomprehension and without language to help us out. And meanwhile, the most obvious expression tool can be a limiting factor. Food stands out as an all ground means of communication because it is unique to every culture and yet universal to human life. We do not all use a modern Latin alphabet, but we all have culinary habits. Let's imagine that you are traveling somewhere without knowing the local language. If you get to know the local cooking, you will still have managed to take a step in local culture. On the other hand, if you relied on international fast food to eat, you will feel that you have missed most of your cultural immersion, no matter how much sites and monuments you visited. This is where the power of food as a communication tool relies. It can reach anyone because it addresses not only to our spirit, but also to our senses and feelings, and thus it passes through cultural differences. Finally, going back to the definition I gave at the beginning, communication is also the exchanging of information. It is not a one-way expression, it invites to dialogue and to possible mutual influence. And here I like to think that food is a golden tool because, as I already said, it is common to all cultures and this can be a first step to larger cultural exchanges. Food inspired a social concept called the pizza effect, made up by Bharati in the 70s to classify cultural elements adapted abroad and reimported in a loop influence. Choosing pizza as the icon of this phenomenon gives a clear message. Coming from Italy, pizza and the wet American adaptations before being adopted back in its new form. So we do clearly have food here as a means of dialoguing between cultures. Of course, all exchanges have limits and are not all good. The example of pizza is quite relevant. If New York pizza has become popular over the world, Hawaiian pizza is still pretty controversial. And did you know that the Sweden version calls for banana and curry? So I won't be able to develop more and I will let you there with the questions I have. Shall we consider all cultural adaptations as a natural development of cultural exchange or shall we draw a line between cultural appreciation and appropriation? And if so, how can we avoid cultural appropriation meanwhile maintaining those cultural dynamics? It's too late for pizza, but we can still act and to protect and communicate other traditions. Thank you. Okay, well, after this, you can tell it's almost in your time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, all right, now we are done with the presentations. Thanks to all our wonderful speakers of this afternoon for bringing such interesting topics. Um, I now give the floor to our attendants. Anyone who has questions can either raise your hand and participate directly in the Q&A, or if you prefer, you can write in the chat, just make sure you address the speaker. Okay, no one has questions? <laughs> okay, well, uh, then thank you all. Uh, I think this concludes our, our session of today, but if you are interested in continuing this discussion and sharing your idea, oh, well, we, we've, got a, we've got a question, sorry. <laughs> I moved on too fast. Yes, sorry, please. Can we talk about a pure culture in terms of multiculturalism. I I guess this one goes for Selena maybe because of her presentation. Yeah, actually, um, of course, if you ask me, uh, if I, for example, use uh, myself as as an example, if you ask if you ask me if I am like um, having the same culture as the other uh, mainland Chinese, I will tell you no because I'm still influenced by the Macau culture. So uh, I cannot say it, but uh, my uh, major cultural identity is still Chinese. Like 
we uh, like if we consider about this co uh, question, I would say that which one you consider your, is yourself a uh, major cultural identity, then which one is your major culture? Yes. And then maybe it's true that it's not uh, like there is no 100% Chinese culture because even in, in, chi in China, we have different kinds of city. So even between different cities, they have different uh, uh, traditional or different eating and living style. So it's difficult to say uh, how is 100% Chinese culture because culture as what I say are always changing, just change in a very special way. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Selena. And I, I then guess this is all for, two, for, for today for our Q&A session. Um, as I was saying, uh, now if you're interested, uh, we are going to participate in our breakout rooms. Uh, however, if you are not able to stay with us any longer today, we want to thank you for your participation and ask that you kindly log off in the next few moments so that we are able to divide in the in the remaining group into breakout rooms.